Hi, I'm Scott Humphrey, CEO of the World Floor Covering Association, and thank you for joining us for this next Knowledge is Power webinar. Uh, hopefully, you're joining us for the second part, and you were with us at the first part as well. Last week, uh, same day, same time, we had installers, professional installers, coming on and speaking to us about what they wish professional retailers knew. And we decided this would be a good opportunity to have both sides speak to each other and really bridge the gap between each other because there has been some miscommunication over time. In fact, last week, that was the number one takeaway was that we need better communication on both sides and that would help everybody. So this week we have a group of professional flooring dealers, several of whom have background in installation, uh, go, talking to installers about what they wish installers knew. And we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm going to introduce our panelists and guests. But before we do that, let me remind you of just some basic essentials. You have a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, simply go down and enter them in the Q&A and uh, we'll, we'll get to them. I've got some other questions I know we'll be asking, but we'll try to cover all your questions toward the end of our time together today. Let me also remind you of all that the WFCA has had going on. You've probably been involved in more than one of these webinars where we spoke to you about what was going on in Washington, D.C. related to the pandemic and our response and, and really combining your voice with ours to make sure that we're heard to really make a difference up there. We've got a phenomenal lobbying group called Lobby who has kept us very involved in all the negotiations. We've had some great success because our voice is combined with yours and we thank you for that. If you've got any questions about anything going on from a government standpoint related to coronavirus, if you go to WFCA.org, you'll see there immediately a coronavirus response tab. Click on that and everything that we have done, all the Q&A that has come into our legal counsel, Jeff King, every question he's answered, everything is there for you. Every webinar we've done, all accessible so that you have the answers that you might be looking for. And I'll just remind you, there still are PPP loans available out there. If you have not applied for one, there is still funding available. You have the ability to do that. Um, the cutoff date was extended for that. Well, the purpose of today's webinar is really to, to bridge the gap. So uh, I'm really thankful to have Tom Jennings um, with us this week. Tom's a dear friend, but also, uh, before his retirement was over the education platform for WFCA and Tom several years ago introduced me to CFI and to Robert Barden and uh, we began having conversations about how we could bridge this gap. So when the topic of professional flooring dealers talking to installers came up and I, I remember this being one of the things that Tom was passionate about that he loved to speak about. I wanted to make sure that we had him on here and he, he can validate much of what I'm sharing you, with you about the history of how long this has been a passion of ours. Uh, last week in introducing this segment, we mentioned a book called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And often that's kind of the view we have of professional installation and professional flooring. And we need to bridge that gap. So let me quickly give you an introduction and then I'm gonna let these, uh, these panelists share with you a little bit more about their background. First, as I've already mentioned, we have Tom Jennings. Again, he's a phenomenal trainer vast history within the industry was a carpet one dealer has done a lot of work within the industry with different organizations and speaks a lot on helping installation and retail communicate with each other and how they can do very small things to make a very big difference. He's joined by Don Roberts, the owner of Central Alabama Flooring. He is also on the executive committee of the WFCA and the Floor Covering Education Foundation which is uh, behind much of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, Henry Scott from Greensboro, North Carolina is joining us. He is also a Carpet One dealer. He'll be sharing with you a little bit about his history. And he has some background in installation. He's joined by Gary Brown, owner of Carpet One Four and More in Springdale, Arkansas. I think Gary told me he had six locations in Northwestern Arkansas. Uh, good to have you on Gary and John Mazzullo. And he is the owner of Missoula and Sons Carpet One Floor and More in Syracuse, New York. This is not our intention really to get just Carpet One on here, but I will use this as an opportunity to say to any of the other groups that are out there, if you've got something we can, we can discuss with you or with the industry as a whole, and we can be beneficial as a mouthpiece for you, we would, we would love to serve you in any way that we can. So panelists, again, thank you. I can't wait to meet you in person and be able to extend the hand or fist bump or elbow or whatever it is that you do. But if you would take just a moment and Tom, we'll start with you and just give us a brief and remember, I, I hate to say it, but your answers really need to be brief because we've got a lot of questions we want to get to you. 
and want to make sure that we can also field any questions by those who are, who are watching us today. So, uh, Tom, starting with you, fill us in on your experience in the flooring industry and highlight any expertise or any experience you have on the installation side, even in your case with the training component. Okay, thank you. Well, I've been doing this since uh, birth. I always jokingly say I was born on the bed pile, but uh, <laughs> my parents started a business two years before I was born in 1950, so you can figure out how old I am. I uh, often laughingly said, as soon as I learned how to get up off my knees and walk, my dad decided it was time to get down on my knees and crawl again. And uh, the first installation job I remember working on one summer was installing about a mile and a half of four inch rubber cove base uh, at the University of Kansas in the town where I live. And so I learned real early why most installers hate cove base. But, uh, <laughs> it's uh, something that I've did working my way through school and, and so forth. Um, got to be a good enough installer that at least as I moved into management of the store, I understood, I understood the, the plight of installation. I understood some customers were more fun than others. Uh, 100 yards today is not necessarily 100 yards tomorrow. So uh, I have experience running crews uh, employees, a good many years running all employee crews but I've used subcontractors or, or workrooms to fill in uh, overflow and so forth. So I've got background both areas. As Scott indicated, uh, I sold our business in uh, 14 years ago now after 56 years. And because I kind of had a passion to go do some training and look out a different window. I'd been going to the same store <laughs> for my whole life. And uh, so uh, the last 14 years I've been working largely with through the WFCA in one capacity or another, but done a lot of a lot of training. Several of you mentioned that you've seen me at Education Day at your conventions and so forth. Um, but I have a passion particularly for training installers and training installers in terms of customer service. Uh, in fact, I, I have a handout here that I've used for years, but it, responsibilities of the sales professional to the installer and responsibilities of the installer to the sales professional. And I use it in every class. So it should hey, Tom, be a fun topic for what we're doing today. Yeah, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question you specifically about that. Let me get these introductions on for everybody else, and I'll ask them all the same question. Don, if you would fill us in on your background now as well and give us a little bit of your knowledge of, <laughs> and especially your passion on the installation side. Well, okay. I've been in the flooring industry. I started my 46th year this July. <clears throat> um, I've always, for the most part of my life, I've always run other people's companies. Um, but over the years, I've, I've been involved in, uh, I've run uh, crews, probably thousands of crews of installers. I had 148 stores down the East Coast that uh, I was responsible for. But, uh, you know, until recently, I didn't have in, uh, employee installers. And I'll tell you, it, it's, it's a different world, and it's actually a world that I like better than the subcontractors. But I'd like to get a little bit more conversation on that. But being in, uh, in our industry this long, you can't have can't go without having a passion for the independent retailer uh, as well as the installation contractor, what they do for us and uh, what is done in our business and the opportunities that they have to grow. I mean, you, you've got men on this, on this webinar here that all started in installation and now own very successful companies in our industry. And uh, there, is a, there is a career path for those that want it. And uh, I think uh, we'd like more to, to take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you, John. Henry, uh, tell us a little bit about you and, again, any experience on the installation side. Well, I was in the floor covering business. My dad was in the floor covering business back in Tampa, Florida, back in the mid-50s and the mid-60s. I sold a store to Miami Rug Company back around 66. I was probably in eighth grade then. But my parents divorced. My dad moved to North Carolina. So in college, after my sophomore year, I decided to go visit dad for the summer and got a summertime job working at one of his friend's stores in the warehouse. And then a couple of weeks later, they put me on a truck as a helper. During that summer, what I enjoy the most is just working with your hands. There's something about working with your hands when you finish the installation, the way the carpet's tucked next to the walls. I mean, if it looks really good, it looks really good. And I really took pride in that. And so when school started back up, South Florida's on the quarter system. I stayed out for a quarter 
And honestly, I, I just never went back. I did good in school. I just enjoyed doing what I was doing. I think one thing that helped me after about three years of that, I had an opportunity to go work in a retail store selling. And that really gave me a, a understanding from a salesperson's point of view. And then when I left to start my own company, I went back to getting the tools out. And, you know, I, I couldn't tell Ms. Jones next door needed floor covering back until that new house did. So one thing led to another, and then we, we grew as a company. One thing I always enjoyed as a installer, besides carpet, was really the six foot, the old days of inlaid. Armstrong, designer Solarian. Uh, as most of y'all know, it's all about the floor prep. How, how smooth you get the floor mm -hmm. before you ever install it. And uh, we just took pride in what we do. Today, I'm like Don, we've got three crews that are employees and all the rest of our crews are subcontractors. I do take pride in saying that the average crew has been with our company for 19 years. Uh, and, and we're just very fortunate with having good crews and good people. Good, thank you very much. Henry, good to meet you by video. Uh, Gary? Yes, I appreciate the opportunity with you all. Um, you know, I've been flooring for basically 50 years. Started when I was 12. My stepdad was a flooring installer. And uh, obviously, he needed help, and, and he was e I was an easy pickup to go help him. So after school, weekends, that type of thing, we'd, we'd lay floors. And did that basically until I was 15. At 15, he went ahead and... <laughs> Uh, he would take a job. I would take a job. He dropped me off. Couldn't drive, but he'd take me off. Uh, drop me off as, as a helper, and we'd lay that job. And then he'd come back later and pick me up. So, basically, did that till for basically 10, 12 years in that range. There, um, middle twenties, went ahead and worked at a store in the warehouse, and uh, continued to lay and sell floors on the side. And uh, eventually worked up to managing the store. And uh, basically, nineteen eighty eight, opened my first store in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we have six locations here, Springdale, Bentonville area, the northwest corner. And uh, installation has always been my passion. Like I say, I, I enjoy it. We have a lot of crews. A lot of installation crews always need more. And um, it's just been always a, a side of, you know, we, the sales side is great. And, the, you know, as far as that type, which is great. But the installation is a side, like Henry said, just seeing a job well done when it's all through and with, with your crews out there and having customers call and, and thank you for, for the opportunity of having those people, our installers in their homes. It's just been wonderful. It's been a great life. I've really enjoyed it. So, Thank you, Gary, very much. And you hadn't let me down. I knew somewhere in your background I would see something from the Razorbacks. Yeah. Back over your right shoulder back there, I think I see a little football or something. Most so, definitely. You're right. Do we? Here we go. Um, <laughs> all right, John. Yes, sir. Well, I'm John Mazzullo, and I'm from Oneida, New York which is between Utica and Syracuse, New York. Small city, about 12,000 people. Uh, family business, my grandfather started in 1948. And uh, about 19, actually 1969, I would say, I actually kind of started monkeying around a little bit with carpet. And then 1970, uh, my dad was able to talk one of our subcontractors to take me out on the road with him the days that he worked for us, which was two days a week. And after about six months, uh, my dad put me out on my own installing, and uh, fortunately, I learned pretty quick. And and uh, I didn't know everything when I started, but I figured it out as I I went along. Uh, so I installed from like 1970 till 1984. Uh, back injury caused me to get out of the installation side in 1984, but I installed a, a lot of carpet, mainly carpet, some vinyl. Uh, I enjoyed the work. Uh, it was good. I was very proud of myself because I didn't ever have callbacks. Uh, I can't say I never had a callback, but most of the time if I had to go back, there really wasn't anything wrong or it was so minor, but was very proud of the work that I did. Did a great job for a family business. And uh, 1992, my brother Michael and I took over the business. We purchased it from our, our dad and his brother. And uh, we're still at it. I have uh, one crew that works for me on my books. Uh, and then I have uh, three subcontracting crews that do work for me. Um, and it good. works out well. It's a good life. Good deal. John, thank you very much. And again, part of the reason I wanted these gentlemen to be on here and ask Don to reach out and get them to join us is because we really speak two different languages. You know, there's the language of installation, there's the language of the flooring dealer. 
And these guys are bilingual. They speak both languages. They've had experience there. They certainly have compassion for the people that, that start their career on their knees, as we say, and uh, have worked their way up. And, and so it really means a lot to have you guys on here. I want to I want to go back to you guys now and just ask you a very simple question, probably the meat of what we want this webinar to be about. What is the most common mistake that you see professional installers make? I'm not necessarily talking about in the installation process, although that could be it, but maybe it's, you know, customer interaction or whatever it may be. But I would ask you guys just to each of you to share with us, what's the most common mistake you see professional installers make? Don, I'm going to go back to you. We'll hop around a little bit so we don't go in the same order the whole time. But Don, why don't you start by answering that question? Sure. You know, I, I think one of the things is, I, I think a lot of installers don't realize how important they are. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I know we all have people, and just, just like salespeople, we have people that have that attitude, you know, that they're, they're all that and people that, you know, are, are very humble and what have you. But the the impression that our installation crews make on our consumer is the one that's lasting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, say what you want. Um, one of the reasons I like having employee installers today over having uh, subcontractors is I can dictate how they look. I can dictate how they dress. I can, you know, dictate hopefully how they act. And, and, and we have meetings to discuss, you know, those type of things to, so that they are a little bit more professional. Um, I think a business owner as a subcontractor, you know, uh, there's a lot of guys that are part of CFI and they go through all that extra training and updating and everything else. But there's also a lot of guys out there that don't realize that a van that's all half rusted out that, you know, uh, needs a new paint job and, and the windows are taped up with duct tape doesn't tell the customer a good feeling that, that you've got their best interests at heart when you're going to their home. Um, those type of things, you know, are, are, are lasting impressions. You could be absolutely the best mechanic in the world, but at times your attitude and the way you carry yourself with a customer and the way you present yourself with the way you look and dress, and, you know, no, nothing against tattoos and hoop earrings and all that other type of stuff, but you know what? You got to dress for your customer. You know, if, if your customer is a, you know, 76 year old lady that lives in a very nice upscale neighborhood, Eh, she didn't want to see that. I don't care how great an uh, installer you are, how great a mechanic you are. They're, they're just not, they're not going to accept it. They're going to judge. And unfortunately, you know, what, good or bad, right? So those are, that's one of the things that's always set with me is, you know, make sure that you show a professional, uh, that you're a professional, that your van, that you, you take care of your tools, things are clean, neat, organized. I always love looking at an installer's van. You know, if you got post-it notes all over the windshield, you got last six months worth of lunch up on your dashboard, that eh, might be a good idea to maybe clean that out every once in a while. All right, good, Don, thank you. Henry, we'll go back to you. Uh, what's the most common mistake that you see professional installers make? Well, you know, I agree with Don, appearance would be foremost in that when you're going to the customer's house, they're looking at you. You know, they may be looking through the drapes or blinds and seeing what's coming up. So I would say appearance. I would say little things that we've seen in the past has been sometimes, let's say a situation occurs on the job site. Uh, in fact, we had one about six months ago where we do not cut doors, but the, the, the installer decided to cut this customer's door and cut it wrong, cut it upside down, and they didn't communicate. So communication, calling the store saying, hey, you know, Mrs. Jones wants us to cut the doors, what would you like me to do? Or, or whatever the situation may happen, communicate to the dealer first. So both of us are on the same page is what I see. And then probably the other thing, maybe in carpet, particularly we don't do as much carpet today as we did 10, 15 years ago, but still not running it according to the diagrams like we had it laid out from measure and RFMS and so forth. So communication and appearance would be two that would be high on my list. Cool. Gary, anything to add to that? You know, uh, same thing they're saying. Uh, one of the main things too is, is value the customer. And by saying, by meaning that, understand the customer is really writing the check. I, you might work for a store, and yeah, at the end of the week, you pick up your payroll check from us. But at the end of the day, you're working for that, that lady or that gentleman there at the job site. And do everything in your power to make sure they're happy. Great attitude. Go above and beyond that. And just know at the end of the day, they're your customers. They're the people that are taking care of you. They bless you with the opportunity of being in their home. And so treat that with respect and, and, and go ahead and main thing, just value them. 
Good, very good. Thank you, Gary. John? Well, one thing that uh, just, I guess maybe just a little different perspective is uh, find so many of the installers don't uh, invest in themselves and in their, in their business. They seem to live from week to week, paycheck to paycheck, which many Americans do. Uh, maybe, you know, you're not charging enough for your services. And, uh, you know, if you are getting a fair wage, you need to reinvest some of that money, put some of that money away. So when you need new tools, you can afford to do it. Uh, so, you know, you can upgrade your vehicle and, and other equipment. And uh, I find that uh, a lot of guys just don't do that. Yeah, that's a great point, John. There's a reason that the three of you that some people move from that onto something else or, or they simply stay within installation, but they go to having their own crews. I've met some phenomenal guys through CFI and, and ladies through CFI that have had great success in this. But some people understand how to control their finances and invest in their business and go through additional certifications to differentiate themselves. And other people simply go out and do the job. And there is a difference between those. Tom, I saved you for last on purpose because I know this is a topic you often talk on, but above and beyond what you've heard these gentlemen say, what else would you say to installers that you see maybe one or two common mistakes that they, that they make? Well, speaking specifically to subcontractors, which roughly three fourths of the industry is, they are very unprofessional operationally. And I, and I hear what you're saying about what their truck looks like and what their shoes look like and this and that. But I'm saying they don't know any more about doing the books than the bookkeeper does about installing a floor. And so many times at CFI meetings and all I've heard, well, my wife takes care of the books. And I'm thinking, well, that, that sounds nice, but that could be a problem. Um, if I had to take a, a new installer and get him set up, I'd set him up with a bookkeeper, I'd set him up with a 401k contribution and all. Uh, I've had people ask me, you know, would you want your son to be an installer? I said, I have no problem with my son being an installer. I'd have a little problem with him being an independent contractor as I see him today because when he's my age, he's going to wish that he had a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of advice. It's not a matter of how much money you make. The guy that makes the most money never retires with the most. The guy that lays the most floor is going to retire with the most. It's the guy that keeps the most. And I think as an industry, yeah. we don't do a very good job. And a lot of it is our fault. You know, we say, you know, can you handle this? And next thing you know, we split a guy off and form another crew. And we kind of set him up to fail. But operationally, most of them are pretty weak. Hey, Tom, let me turn that just a moment. Because you also see this from the other side. What do, what are retailers doing, Tom, to to impact the installer in a neg negative way? What should the retailer be doing? Well, I can't speak for everybody. So many retailers, they really just, it's all about price. You know, when I hear somebody say we've had our crews for the last 20 years or something, first of all, my antenna go up as far as the legality of that, but that's not what we're here to talk about. But but I think we set these guys up to fail in so many respects that, uh, you know, we just, we try to beat them down. What do you charge? What do you give me? You know, and that's the negotiations. You know, you hear about stores auctioning off jobs at the back door every morning. Now, that was when a time when installers were a little more plentiful than they are probably today. That's also a reason they aren't more plentiful than they are today. Uh, they don't know their costs, you know, operation. I'll do it for 250. Well, they don't know if they can do it for 350. You know, all they know, you know, I always say the dumbest guy in the market sets the, sets the price range. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the smartest guy. It's the dumbest guy. Doesn't matter what, what the line of work is. I don't, you know, we cannot set them up and tell them how to take care of their books and all, but if we had a little different requirements of them, I, I think it might help. Uh, good, good. Henry, I think I butted in on you. Were you trying to say something? Now, yeah, uh, Scott, what I was going to say was when I first started, one thing my father made a suggestion to me years ago, as an installer, take a salary out of your business every week. Just take, to determine what your salary is going to be, take it. That way, when the extra money comes in, you start building up cash, as, as Tom was saying. Then you could upgrade. You could buy more tools. You could upgrade your van, whatever. So establishing a salary, a budget, for what your salary would be, would be one thing I would highly suggest installers. Good. 
All right, guys, I open it to you really quickly uh, for the rest of you, just as Henry did. Anything else occur to you that we want to let the installers know that would help them? I'm sorry, ask that uh, question again to me. No, Henry, not for you since you've already done it. I was just asking the others, is there anything else they'd like to share for the installers that are able to join us today, these professional installers that might help them on their jobs? You know, Scott, one, one of the things that, that Henry brought up, it, it, the communication part of this thing, you know, one mm -hmm. of the things that installers may or may not realize, and I think most do, and unfortunately sometimes they realize it too far after the fact, is that when we send them out on a job, we've got a job that's already pre-costed with the customer. We've already charged the customer for whatever it is we're going to do out at that house. And we basically have told the installer what we're going to pay them, right? Now, we all know that that, that, that stays that way probably half of the time. And then half of the time, if we're taking some product up or we're doing something, something comes up out on that job that costs us to have to do something else, right? Um, what about the cutting off the doors, for example. The only way we can charge a customer extra money for is to be able to let them know up front that something was an unseen type thing when we were out there. Like, again, if we're taking up carpet, we didn't look under their, underneath their carpet before we you know, came out to remove it. And all of a sudden we got rotted plywood and we got to change out plywood. And we got to do this and that. People just doing that coming, an installer just doing that for the customer in the home and then just coming back into our, our office and say, yeah, I'd replace two sheets of plywood. You owe me this much more um, when we didn't even get an opportunity to, to charge the customer. And here he goes and does all the labor uh, and everything without us, you know, getting that opportunity. So the, the communication thing is, is the, is the biggest part of this thing because we want to have them get every dime that they can get off of a job and we and, and ultimately the consumer needs to pay for whatever work is done in their house we shouldn't be paying for it nor should the installer by the way Good. all right gary or john yes scott i'd i'd add, uh just add um <clears throat> diversify <clears throat> do multiple floors I mean, I, it's such a, you know, there's a lot of times that we have jobs that, you know, I have maybe a tile setter, that's all he does is tile. He's a great guy, awesome, you know, ability, but he, he only lays tile. Well, I might have 20 hardwood jobs or three, 13 carpet jobs or LVT or whatever, that I have a great guy sitting at home that I can't pay him what I need to pay this week. And so diversify, do, I mean, I love the idea of having a star walk in a home and do the entire job. So I don't have to introduce Mrs. Consumer to two or three different stallers because we have two different two or three different floors going down. She likes the first person. She loves him. He does a great job, and that's it's we're done and moving on with the job. So main thing as far as any, especially any new people that are out there, uh, diversify, learn multiple floors, multiple applications, so I can keep you busy every single day, working five six days a week. So. That's great advice now, Gary, because there are a lot of consumers that are concerned about more people coming into their home. Right. So if you can keep it as one crew coming in and not have multiple crews coming back, that gives them a little bit more peace of mind. All right, most definitely. Good, John, anything from you? No, the, the only thing that came to mind, and uh, this might be what you would hear from the installer side more, is, you know, as uh, employers, uh, you know, whether with your employees or with your subs is to, for, I guess some advice for us is to let the guys know that you appreciate the good job that they do for you mm -hmm. and in the hard work that they do. Yes. Here, here. You know, sometimes you get busy. Uh, sometimes I get busy and I, and I don't always let my guys know how much I do appreciate them and how important they are to my business. Well, that, John, that's, that's great. I mean, here we are saying that you're a reflection of our business. You go out, whether you're an employee of us or not, you're a reflection of our business. Well, if you're not communicating with them and if you're not letting them know you appreciate them, you're probably part of, part of the problem that they're reflecting negatively on you. Yes. Yeah, we've got to keep that communication line open. All right, guys, I wanted to go to a couple of questions we've had asked here a lot more. This is just simply dialogue between people, but uh, Kenneth asked, do any of you offer a profit sharing plan? Anybody? We do. Uh, Scott, we do. Good. Talk we to offer, that. If you... uh, we do a 401k. We match 4%. Now, these are for the employee installers. Correct. And then uh, we, we pay 50% of the insurance, and they have two weeks paid vacation. After they've been with the company for 13 years, they have three weeks paid vacation. 
That's good. I, I think legally you probably could not offer those benefits to a subcontractor. I think it could only be employees because that's correct. That's correct. That. Yeah, we, we do the same thing with our employee only. I mean, you, they, they get vacation time. They get, you know, they get paid time off. They get a Christmas bonus. They get, um, we have a 401k plan that they can put into. Um, they, they have access to our healthcare, dental, vision, you know, uh, makes a big difference. In fact, a couple of my guys, I know, I know they're there because of the healthcare, you know. So Don, let me speak to that a little bit further with you. So you, you mentioned a moment ago, the difference between the employer crews and the subcontractor crews, and you talked about why that's beneficial to you. Step on the other side. Why should an installer consider becoming an employee versus continuing as a subcontractor? Well, again, it goes back to those that, those that can manage their business and those that can't. You know, I, I think there's a, I think there's, a, there's a lot of pride taken by a lot of people that own their own business. And I think if you're an installer today and you, and you like the idea of owning your own business and do it professionally, because there's a lot of them out there that are very good at what they do. Um, it, it's the difference between working for somebody and, and owning your own business, right? Um, so I, I've always, I mean, I, I, I didn't own my own flooring stores until five years ago. Um, you know, I always worked for somebody else. I always drew a salary or a, an incentive or whatever. And I went to work and it was a job. And I think, I think people do look at it that way. They look at it, whether they're, they're going to a job or they're, they own their own business and they, and they take pride in, in owning that business. I, I will tell you, it, it goes back to any industry. I don't care what industry it is. We all know those doctors that came out of college. You know, the guy becomes a neurosurgeon and he goes bankrupt because he's got great skills in the, in the operating room, but his business skills stunk. You know, and one of the things that we're talking about in the Floor Covering Education Foundation is when we get these young kids out of high school and we get them into training, if we can also get them into like a two-year business degree at the same time for those that want to own their own business. Um, in, in my case, you know, I've got a lot of employee installers. A third of my guys are employees, and they like being employees, you know, but they like the idea of the benefit. By the way, their taxes are taken out of their check. You know, we submit them. They file their taxes at the year end, but they're not freaking out thinking somebody's going to knock on their door and file a garnishment on them, you know, now, maybe for other reasons, but not, not because they're not paying their taxes. So. Okay, good, Don. Uh, so, um, Gary or John, do either of you have employee crews as well? Ours are all sub subcontractors. Okay. So, yeah. And we've we've uh, looked at the other possibility, which I've talked to Don directly on that. And uh, you know, the ones I've approached, they're have again, they've they run their own businesses and they would like to continue with that. So I mean, uh, it's that's how it seems like it's worked for us. Yeah. John? Uh, we have for years had just one crew that are employees, the rest rest our subcontractors. Uh, I like having uh, an employee crew because, uh, you know, I do have a little more control. Uh, the thing that, that, that the employees have is they have a guaranteed paycheck every week. Uh, you know, they don't have to worry about when things slow down. If things slow down, you know, they still get at least 40 hours in a week. You know, they might be doing a little work around the warehouse or something around the store, but but they have a guaranteed paycheck every week rather than, you know, maybe sometimes sitting home quite a bit. And John, I would imagine, do they also have the ability to set the pace and the tone for your subcontract crews? So if your employee crews are doing it a certain way and their professionalism is up to par, then obviously the subcontract crews see that and should have some positive impact, I would imagine. Yeah, they, def they definitely do. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, my subcontract crews have been with me a long time and they're very professional. Uh, you know, just like uh, probably everybody on this panel, the problem that I have is I do not have enough installation crews available to, to me to, mm -hmm. you know, to get every, I could do more work if I had, if I had more help. Uh, I just put an ad on Facebook uh, yesterday looking for a floor covering installation apprentice and I've had, a few applications, but I haven't had the opportunity to talk to any of them yet. But, you know, we're looking to train people. Uh, I think that yeah. that works the best. 
Yeah, and it would seem to me that if you're looking for employee crews, getting them from the start that way is probably the easiest way to do it versus yes. onboarding them at a later date. Right, let me touch on something that's a passion to me and I think can be somewhat controversial, but um, does certification matter? And let me ask that from two standpoints. I know it matters because you feel more confidence, but does it matter in the pay to the installer? Do installers, do your installers make differing amounts based on the quality of the job that they do or what you know they're capable of? And uh, Henry, I'll start with you. That's a great question. Unfortunately, I think as we pay our, as we pay our installers, it's hard, it's hard for me to pay one sub a quarter, you know, a quarter yard more or a nickel more foot than another one, because I'm so afraid, you know, we'll, we'll, it gets out and becomes, it comes, it becomes a problem. What I don't like about it, though, if you're a really good installer, every day you get what? You get the toughest jobs. You always get the toughest jobs. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that you get so the true. toughest part, you know? You're not getting anything easy. So it's really, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I, have, I don't know an answer to that question. That's a great question. Uh, I just know that we do pay our guys more than our market area by about 7%, between 5 and 7%, depending on what you're installing. And so we do attract the better crews and we keep them and we do a lot of things for them, making sure they get you know loaded up on time, make sure they got all the paperwork. If there's a problem on the job site, they got wrong transition strip. We're sending it out there with our truck. We're not making them come back because they didn't cause the problem. So we really look after them. But okay. That is a challenge. <laughs> yes, but there are some ways you differentiate, at least in the, in the way that you yeah. treat them. It may not be salary based, but let me ask this question here while you're on there. Do you encourage them to continue their training and education, even the subcontract, you can't make them, obviously. You, you don't, they're not employed. We, right? uh, we, we brought in an installer uh, from the Stanton Group probably two years ago, Rodney out of Atlanta, uh, to show us some spe special ways of running a seam involving woven carpets. Mm. Uh, and we'll do things of that nature or bring in somebody, but we haven't sent them off to get certified. We have not done that with any of our installers for quite some time, actually. We probably, last time we did that was probably, gosh, maybe 12, 14 years ago. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think, again, from a legal standpoint, you had to be very careful um, sending your subcontract employees for that, depending on some state guidelines. But, but you know, certainly, if you've got your own employees, encouraging that's a, a different issue. John, back to you. How about you on that? Are there any variations in the way that you treat or pay your, your better installers versus those that are maybe new? Uh, really, the, the the biggest variation would be is, you know, what I pay my employees hourly versus my subcontractors. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, I'm sure you've experienced, uh, I've got employee installers. When I will also give them uh, work. They can work as a subcontractor, like at night or weekend for me. And I do pay them different in those times. And sometimes it does amaze me at how fast they can actually get a job done when they're just working for themselves. Yeah. Uh, but uh, between, I, I've got uh, three subcontractor crews and they're not 100% equal in, in pay, uh, but pretty close because guys, you know, they talk and one finds out you're paying him more than, than the next guy. It really causes trouble. Yeah. How about you, Gary? You know, we pretty well pay him all the same. We really do. Uh, I mean, we don't, as far as certification, things like that, uh, we've had tech people come in, like from a vendor, have a mill come in and train all of our, our installers in the mornings. They'll come in for like a two day training. So we can kind of get some of that hour, hour and a half in the morning done. We can kind of train them as a group, especially when we have some new products that are out. So we, especially back prior to COVID, we was able to do that more more frequently. So we did come in, we run between 25, 30 crews. So it always need more than that. So, um, you know, we do have that. I mean, it's, um, I, I honestly, I pay them all. I'm like, you know, um, Henry, we pretty well pay them all the same. I mean, I, uh, they all get, you know, obviously you have some of them that are work longer and make more, uh, but basically um, they're all, as far as it's all paid, same rates. Yeah. Okay. And Don, did I ask you that question? No, no, I, actually, uh, I was going to tell you a couple of things. Um, number one, John pays his people either salary or hourly as his employees. I pay my employees by the piece rate. 
So my, my employees are not paid salary, they're not paid hourly, but all they have to do is meet, you know, they have to exceed the minimum requirement uh, for minimum labor wage act for their hours, you know, time and a half if they're working over 40. So it, 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 my people do have an opportunity to make as much as they can make in a day if they put down a lot of square footage. Um, it's, uh, you know, in a former life, um, we, we lit I had a company that literally ran thousands of installers and they were all subcontractors and they all had different rates. Every one of them were negotiated individually and separately. Now, the cool thing, even today, I use RFMS software and I think a lot of these guys do on this, on the webinar here, RFMS has the capability of tracking every subcontractor's rates separate uh, in them. So if you had 10 installers and you have 10 different rates, you can, you can track that and assign that per job in RFMS. Because, you know, because what Henry said, your, your best installers get the toughest jobs and you want to make sure that, you know, on those tougher jobs, you're, you're paying appropriately for the work and charging appropriately for that customer. And I hate to say it, just like all salespeople are not created equal, all installers are not created equal. You know, it, uh, it makes a big difference. But I think there's a lot of, lot of legalities here between subcontractors. You know, having people working for only you for a long time, you, know, you got to be careful with the way you talk on that stuff. Um, and uh, negotiating rates, you know, again, you, you take care of the people that, that have those uh, additional qualifications. You, know, you got somebody that can weave seagrass and put a seam together, you know, on a on a project like that that really knows what they're doing. They're they're worth a lot of money to you, you know, especially if you're doing a lot of beach work like Henry does because that's where he lives now. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those pictures behind him. <laughs> that is great. Oh. Hey Tom, <laughs> go ahead, Henry. Now I said <laughs> I can't say anything. I'm I'm fine. <laughs> He's messing with you. <laughs> hey, Tom, I know this is a passion of yours. Talk about the value of certification and training and why that's so important. Okay. You know, before I do that, though, Scott, I'd like to say, you know, WFCA has legal counsel and I'm not it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been through an audit myself. I have been worked with dealers around the country that have had them. And boy, the hair on my neck just went up several times. Uh, First question they're going to ask is who sets the prices. So you know, like I said, I'm not here to give advice, but be careful because yeah. you, you will be asked. Um, you know why I think it's so important, Scott is. You know, I just hear that you know we haven't had our guys trained for a number of years, uh, or they haven't been through through training. You know, I got to go to the dentist in the morning. I kind of hope they go through some continuing education. You know, I hope the guy didn't get out of school 20 years ago and said, all right, I know I know it because everything has changed, I'm sure, in that industry. Uh, when I've been through classes that, you know, like Robert Varden through CFI have done and so forth, and just in the last two, three, four years, the backings and the adhesives and the way they respond and so forth are so different uh, that we've got guys that, you know, one of the first questions I'd ask somebody, they all come in the front door, I got 20 years experience like I'm supposed to care. And you know, the first thing I said is, let's talk about year one. Who taught you? You know, it'd be like, I've been playing golf 20 years. That doesn't mean I'm any good. It just means I'm consistent. And you know, <laughs> you may not have learned the correct way 20 years ago, but you learned how to do it faster and, and, and replicate it every day. So in your mind, you're doing good work. Um, you know, I think that no matter what level installers are in, and we've seen it, you know, try to get them to come into a class when they're 40 years old and they've been doing this 20 years and they close their arms and they clench and they act like, all right, now try to teach me something. And then usually by about 15, 20 minutes, their arms are down and they're kind of engaged if we've got good certifiers, but they realize how much they don't know. And I, I, I would only want to say the same thing just to retailers out there when they say diversify you know, it doesn't matter if you're a carpenter, if you're an electrician, what you are, you're only as good as your tools. And when we ask guys to go out and do a half a dozen different floor surfaces, uh, they cannot possibly have the correct professional tools to do them all, or they're going to have to pull a trailer just to carry the tools. I mean, 
I can't think of anything other than a hammer and a tape measure that's similar from a ceramic installation than a hardwood installation, for example. And yet we act like they just got everything on their truck and they can go handle this. Um, some guys can, but I'm saying inspect what you expect. It's pretty hard to be really professional unless you are really, you know, invested in doing that sort of thing every day. <laughs> but I, I think basically it's just continuing education is, is to everybody's benefit, and installers as well. They only got to eliminate one mistake, and they've paid for that day's class. So. I can point. talk to an hour about it, but I won't. Yeah, Tom, listen, when I hear you talk, it's like, it's like when I, I love to hear Lou Holtz talk about football. That's how I can sit and listen to you talk about installation and professional flooring because you speak the language so well. You know, Scott, um, one of the things with Tom, um, we had Tom come in a couple years ago and, and talk. You know, we, we, did, we brought in uh, CFI. We got our installer certified on hardwood, laminate, carpet, ceramic tile. I mean, I literally shut down my installation for a week to run everybody through this. And I had some mad installers, I'm telling you. They were not happy. They, you know, they knew it all. I've done, I've done, like I said, I've done this for 20 years. You know, I could teach that class. I could blah, 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 you know, the whole thing. But I'm going to tell you something. After they started getting engaged, at the end of it, the one guy that gave me the biggest hard time on this whole thing came up and said, you know, Don, I've been doing this wrong for 20 years. I could have saved myself so much time, effort, and energy had, wow. I, had I gone through these things. Plus, Tom sits down with them, you know, and, and speaks their language. He talks to them about how you deal with the customer, when you go in the house, and what's that first impression, and the communication that you've got to have with the uh, salespeople and understand how the job was sold and figured and everything else. I mean, you can't trade that, you know, on a job. And those guys that take advantage of that for the most part are your, are your top guys. I mean, they're, they're smart. They, they get it. Well, we, we never treat them the soft skills, you know, and that's, that's what really I think is where most of our, you know, the bedside manner he used an example of a doctor a while ago, but they always talk about bedside manner. Yep. Um, I don't want to just get bogged down here in personal stories, but I remember a customer one time, I knew she was going to be tough. This is back when Berber carpet was popular and seam showed. It's kind of one that you're just waiting the next morning for the phone to ring. And it did. And okay, I'll go out at 10 o'clock, met the lady. Uh, said, Betty, this looks pretty good. Nice selection. Share your concerns with me. I still remember her saying, the carpet looks great. We knew it would. Why I wanted you to come out was I wanted you to know that your guys got two glasses down out of our cabinets and drinking glasses and they left the lid up on the stool in our hall bathroom. And we just didn't appreciate that. Yeah. And I'm, you know, make my way out the door, smiling and apologizing. And I'm driving down the street and I'm thinking, why would they do that? And I'm thinking, have you ever talked to your installers? that when you get glasses out of her kitchen cabinet, she thinks you went through her dresser drawers too. You know, she feels like she's been violated. Have you ever taught them, may I use this restroom and then leave it like you found it? And the answer was no. And the next week, that was part of our soft skills class. And you say, what's this got to do with installing the floor? And I'm gonna say nothing. What's it got to do with keeping a customer happy? And I'll say everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do this too with subcontractors. I mean, you can have a class like that. You don't have to charge mm -hmm. for it. You can buy a box of donuts and just, you know, give them some soft skill. Most people have never been taught how to ring the doorbell, you know, what to be carrying and what to say. And uh, so, you know, I think sometimes we spend a lot of time focusing on the physical act of installation and really it's the soft skills that probably will make the difference between a happy customer and not many times. You know, a, medio a mediocre installer with good soft skills, with good personality and everything else, will get rave reviews and the in the installer who is the who's the best mechanic you've ever seen that's got a bad attitude and everything else will get he'll be he'll be under a microscope the entire time he's at a customer's home yeah. i mean yeah. you see it time and time again this is true hey guys let me go through some of the q and let me go through some of the Q&A that I've got here right now because there's quite a few people that responded in. And a lot of this, by the way, if you guys just want to go down and click on Q&A, you'll see a lot of it is just dialogue or people are thinking out loud and expressing their thoughts. Uh, here's one that simply says um, people should answer the phone, have virtual walkthroughs, 
Um, another says the installer makes no money waiting for you to renegotiate with a the customer. They often feel it's better to do it and get permission later. Um, let's face it, most subs are controlled to the point that they're not qualified or misqualified, I should say. Uh, Don, you answered the one about piece rates. Uh, this one says, do you truly pay employees by the hour or say this, this job pays this many hours because quotas happen a lot. Can somebody answer that? Do you truly pay an hourly rate or do you just say this is a four hour job? I, I pay my employees an hourly wage, no matter how long the job takes. They work eight hours, they get paid for eight hours, you know. Yeah. God, I, I do the same thing. Uh, you know, you're estimating what, how long you think it's going to take. It may take just four hours or five, but sometimes it takes six or seven. We still, you know, we pay that. Uh, or with our subcontractors, like Don brought up, if there's some unforeseen conditions, all we ask is they call in, tell us what it is, so we can get with the customer, and then resolve it. And then, you know, everybody's good, installers getting paid, customers paying us, and, and we move on. Uh, I do agree with the installer that he's saying it takes time. I, I think it's very critical that when something like this happens, we try to turn it around very quickly because, you know, an hourly employee, he, he doesn't care if, it, if you take an hour to call him back. But a subcontractor, I was a subcontractor for most of my life starting out. I'm sure a lot of y'all were. Time is money. So if I'm waiting on somebody for 20, 30 minutes to give me a go ahead, I'm not happy. And I can see installers not being happy. Sure. Sure, but if the retailer's getting the money to pay that installer based on something that, you know, we have no control over too, Henry, you, you know that that, that ain't going to work. I mean, oh, no, I agree with you, can't, you. You can't walk back and just say, hey, here's a bill. I had to do an extra $150. I'll worry about it later. Oh, no, I agree with you. I, I think if, it, if the installer should give us a reasonable length of time to respond, and they could be doing something else, maybe, maybe do the other room, work in another room. But I do know sometimes it can drag on. Someone calls, well, you know, I hadn't heard from the customer. Yeah, hours gone by. And, and yeah, we need to do it quickly. Quickly. Yeah. Yep. I agree. So here's another one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, in all my years, I've never heard anybody paying a flat rate, like a four hour job. You know, this is a four hour job. Yeah. That, that's common in other industries, like auto, auto repair, for example. They have a flat rate. They say putting a starter on a car is. A three-hour mm -hmm. job, and if you can get it done in two, you make more money and get on to the next job. I've never heard anybody doing that in the Florida business. Okay. Um, here's a comment where somebody said education and training is penalized in this trade. To a degree, they're right, especially when there's a shortage of installers, because getting the installer to make the decision to step away from income coming in to go and be trained is more difficult than getting people to pay for their employee installers to go and get trained when they have people waiting for product to be installed it's, it's more challenging. There's, there's no doubt uh, the industry itself is part of the challenge, but um, that's part of what we're committed to solving through the Floor Covering Education Foundation and the reason we're having this dialogue today. Um, Got that, uh, that week that I shut down to do the training, yes. I did get ahead of time with all of my vendors. I got them to all put up money, help on the training, and we did pay we paid every installer that went through the training that week, a, not a lot, I think we paid them $350 uh, to go through the training, but whether they were a sub or an employee, I, I paid them 350 bucks so that they had something. Now again, that's not covering a ton of a work in a, yeah. in a week for an installer, but it's what we could do and it, was, and it was more than they would have done had they made the commitment to go get trained on their own. Because they, they by the way, they do own their own business. They are, they should be investing back in themselves on the training so that they can charge more and be of value to more people. Yep, good point, Don. So here's a good question. Uh, this, this person asks, do you offer individual contracts to your subs or do you have a master contract that you offer to everyone? Anybody have varying I, contracts I, for their subs or, or, or is pretty much everyone using a consistent? Because I know we said we, we basically pay all of our subs the same. So you use the same master contract? I, I, use, a, I use a contract for all of them, but you know, the, rate, the rate sheet and everything can vary. I mean, the contract is the contract. It's, it, it's not attached to everything that I'm paying them. I mean, it's, 
basically all the agreements of their insurance and all the things that we do and they do and everything else that goes along with it. Yeah, true. Anyone else want to comment on that one? Yeah, same here. We use the same contract, um, you know, for all of them across because we cover everything there. We did yeah, the here's a okay. Good. Did Henry say what's the contract? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right. Um, so here's another comment. Just a comment, not not for response. It says quotas are another penalty for good installers. No, no wonder no one wants to do this. Oh, yes. And um, Robert asked, are the manufacturers responsive to the training and information needs of the installation community? Absolutely. Do we feel like manufacturers do their part in this? Don, you probably have more dialogue with other manufacturers mm -hmm. through your role with the FCEF and the WFCA. Do you feel like manufacturers are doing their part to help solve the, the problem? Well, I, I think I think the manufacturers are willing to do their part. It's just it's it's the, the what part of it you know are they willing to do right? I mean, one of the things that we're doing with the Floor Covering Industry Foundation is going out to all these manufacturers to start raising money to recruit into scholarship uh, people. Um, I, I think I think our whole industry is willing to do it. I think distributors are willing. Everybody's willing. They just need somebody to take the lead and to get us there. Right. And I think that's what we've done by, you know, starting this floor covering education foundation is we're going to get out in front of this and take the lead. I think you'll see a lot of people, even independent retailers and everybody else, you know, step up here for years, right? For years, the manufacturers are, well, if, if Mohawk does this, it's going to help Shaw. If Shaw does it, it's going to help Daltile. If, you know, if, if I'm a retailer in Birmingham, it's going to help other retailers. At the end of the day, if I need more installers, I just want 10,000 more installers to be able to go after and get that are qualified because we all can grow our business right now. Every one of us on this call, I guarantee if we had three more crews each, we could all grow our business. The economy is good on the flooring side of this business. All right, I've got a couple more real quick, and then I want to ask all of you to be thinking about your final thoughts as we wind down on our time. So um, this one just is making the comment that people should answer the text right away. I had to look and see if that was a message to me if I had a text, but it wasn't to me. It was just telling us all that we should respond quickly. And I think that's on the professional foreign dealer side and also on the installation side. And then uh, Roland Thompson, who many of you know, he says, why can't you pay your better installer more money so the other installers are not happy? That should actually make them want to get better. I do think that that's a valid point. We as an industry, have created this and I think we've got to be willing to look at so what if it makes someone get a little frustrated because they make less money then they ask the question why do I make less and if you have a logical reason for why they make less because this person is certified or this person has this uh, training background and experience that's a justifiable reason for someone to make more money there's a reason that uh, some athletes are paid more than other athletes it's because of their abilities because of what they've gone through to get there so um, I'd definitely that's, pay that's Roland a, Thompson more money. Yeah. <laughs> he's awesome. I would too. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. Good point. Well, we all have the same appeal at Penny of Roland, so that's great. And then I've got one more here that just simply asks, do you include all installation supplies and setting materials in with your labor rates? Installation supplies and setting materials, are they included in the labor rate, Don? I do. I, I supply all the supplies, setting materials, um, everything with the job, including tax strip. Okay. Henry? We do the same thing. We, we supply, particularly on tile, on tax strip, we do not with the subcontractors. We do with the metal, but not the tax strip or the seaming tape. Okay. Gary? Yeah, on hard surface, we furnish all materials. Uh, on that type that's needed. Uh, we don't require on, on carpet, obviously installer first the tax strip and, and uh, heat tape, things like that. Okay, and John? Same as uh, Gary's response. Okay, all right, good. All right, guys, I wanna give you a chance to the last response and Tom, I'll save you for the very end on this. So let's just reverse the order I just went in. John, any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Well, I guess one final thought is, is I've really been uh, enjoyed being a part of the panel and uh, causing me to reflect back on my past 
and in this this industry and uh you know i plan on uh trying to work closer with my installers and i work close with them now uh, i'm always out in the warehouse when they're loading up i help them load their trucks uh they need something when they're on the job i bring it out to them or, or somebody from our store does uh do always let them know that they're appreciated uh I, I tell my guys, the only thing I have to sell is service. It's just service because they go buy floor covering at so many different places. So uh, our service has to set us apart. And that's what I let my guys know all the time. So good let's job. do a good job. John, thank you for being on. Let me just add to what John said. The best advertisement you have for new helpers, apprentices, and installers is the people that you already are working with out there talking about how you treat them. Yeah. What you pay them, how you treat them. So you want them to be out there and be your silent soldiers out there on the street carrying your story for you. Not just on the installation side, but when they, they've got friends and people that are looking for flooring too, you want them to recommend your store over all the others. So yes. good, good advice, John. Thank you. Gary? Thank you. Yes, I appreciate the opportunity being on and also and I'll reiterate what John mentioned. But the main thing is the uh, installers are a part of our family. Boy, we, are, you yes. know, we need them. Uh, and not just need them to do the job. You know, we value them. We want them to be a part of us. I want them to feel like they're included in what we do. And uh, they're a valued part of what we do and everything like that. So uh, just like we treat our sales staff and our other people, uh, installers and their, and their helpers or crews, um, they're, they're inside, very valuable to what we have to complete. And like I said, at the end of the day, they're the ones that last hand to shake a customer when they're facing into the job. And, and uh, that's how we all, that's what we all live for. That, you know, that job well done. So thank you so much. Appreciate you all being, allowing me to be with you. Thank you, Gary, very much. I can't wait till the next time I'm in Northwest Arkansas. I'm gonna look you up, buddy. We'll spend some there time together. Yes. All right, Henry, final thoughts? Well, first I'd like to thank the installers for taking the time today to be on the seminar, because obviously you're not making money if, if you're on the seminar, sure. but you are growing as a person. Uh, Always with me, there's two cues. There's quality and there's quantity. Give me quality. I take quality every day. You want to raise, you want to make more money, you bring me quality every day. Then you look at me eye and you're saying, hey, boss, look, you know, hey, Henry, I'm thinking about I have an opportunity to leave. I have an opportunity to go somewhere else. I know what everybody on this panel is going to do. How much more money do you need? We're going to give it to you. Yes. But they got to have quality. They got to see it. They got to feel it. They got to hear it from the customer. Because one thing we didn't talk about real quickly is reviews. Reviews are so critical for companies today. We, mm -hmm. have, we have over 500 reviews in our company and we rate 4.9 on Google. That's so important. It talks about installers and our company. Yeah, that's a great point, Henry. Thank you. I, I, as we got into this, I could tell you we could have about two more, two more webinars just on follow-up topics related to this, but um, time does not allow. Don, final thoughts? And we actually, I'll tell you, we, we actually pay our installers kind of a little bonus, uh, whether it's a gift card or whatever, if, if we get a review that actually mentions them in the review. So it's, it's kind of a little, little thing to do. But, you know, any time that people take the time out of their day to, to, to listen to someone like this and can communicate with both sides, uh, we've got a great industry. I mean, this is probably one of the best industries that have provided great livings all the way around for people that nobody even knows of. I mean, when you, I mean, when you talk about the trades today, I mean, people know electricians, they know carpenters, they know plumbers, they even know cement guys. But, you know, you look at every building that you drive by, it all needs flooring. And we're one of those invisible trades that people don't know is out there. And, you know, whether you're on the installation side or, or you are a salesperson or you own your own business, you, you've provided a good living for your, for your family for a lot of years. And do everything like Henry says, do it with quality. Quality is what matters. And if, if you're proud about how you handle yourself with a customer, how you handle yourself in your character, nobody can ever take that away from you. So. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Tom, I'll, Tom I'm going to let you close in just a second. Let me just uh, answer a question that just came up. This video will be available on WFCA.org. We do realize we're thanking those who took the time to watch this, but we had quite a few people call us in and say, listen, I can't be there live because I am working but I'd love to see this. And so I want you to, we'll, we'll be sharing that word as well, but this video will be available to all of you. And certainly I know some of the chat rooms that are available 
Facebook has several organizations that communicate. Just share, share the fact that this is out there and available for people to hear and to learn from. And Tom, why don't you send us out on a positive note, buddy? Installation is the one thing you can be high on. You know, product is a commodity. And people are only advocates of service. They say people aren't loyal to a product. They're a lot loyal to a source of supply. And by that, I mean, you say I buy Coca-Cola, I like it better than Pepsi. Uh, that's fine. But if you say I only buy my Coca-Cola at Walmart because it tastes better than the what I get at Target, that's ridiculous. You're loyal to a product. You're not loyal to a source of supply. But on service, you become an advocate of the service provider. And you will go out of your way to, to get to an auto mechanic or to have somebody cut your hair or groom your poodle or a thousand other things that are all service related. So we can build the value in our service. And the last thing I would say, whether you're an installer or a retailer, I just almost universally heard everyone say that they are providing the supplies, they're providing the setting materials and so forth. Do your customers know this and do they know why? You know, if we say to our Please. customers, as you shop around, uh, ask who provides the supplies, ask who provides the mortars and the mastics and the sealers, Many stores have their installers provide it. And by doing so, you're probably going to get the cheapest thing they make. Uh, if I were that installer, I would be providing that. I always use the analogy, I would never have someone paint my house and let them provide the paint. You know, I'll hire them to paint the house, but I'll control the quality of paint. Then we may pick it out at their, their brand. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I'm going to get the cheapest $7 a gallon builder grade they make just to turn my house white or whatever. Yeah. You know, I want to control the recipe. And the products that we sell are just ingredients in the recipe. So installers, the services they provide, you can be a dollar high on service. Uh, you cannot be a dollar high on product because product has a given price. Um, and I'll just share one, one uh, technique I've always done. If I'm in a home and I see a bucket of paint, for example, let's just use paint, or it could be the bricks on the fireplace or the whatever. I will say, you know, ma'am, I'm sure there's a lot of difference in buckets of paint, but you know, I think you'll find there's a great deal of difference in the painters that apply that paint. And at the end of the day, you're going to be, your satisfaction is going to be more affected by the painter than it is the bucket. Well, you know, a box of ceramic tile or a roll of carpet is no different. Uh, that tile's going to be on that backsplash a long time. So let's talk a little bit about the man's going to set that tile. And suddenly you just took the, the emphasis on, on value and you can charge a little more for the man, his services, mm -hmm. but the tile itself is whatever Dale tile decides it's going to be. So really, you know, making that extra two, three, four percent has to all come from the labor and the service side. It cannot typically come from product. Tom, thank you so much. Guys, we'll have Tom back on here and do a couple more of these conferences for him to share some of these wisdom nuggets, I call it. I've been trying to get him to write a book for years, so maybe you guys can encourage him too. I'll also say Tom still does a lot of training, and he does some phone consultation as well. So if you're in need of that, either on the professional flooring side or on the installation side, uh, Tom, Tom is available or we'll let you know what his availability is. Tom, if they want to reach out to you, uh, just share your email address, if you would, uh, if you're willing to. So. I'm willing to, certainly. Uh, it's just like it sounds, tomg.jennings at gmail. G is in Tom George. Tomg.jennings. Tom G, G is in George. Uh, dot Jennings at gmail. Or okay. WSA has got it. If they don't have a pen or something, just the office knows how to get a hold of it. Yeah, they can come through me. And the last thing I'll say, Tom, thank you so much for being on as well. Don, all the guys, um, if you're not a member of the WSCA, combine your voice with ours so we can speak out for you. If you're not a member of CFI and you're on the installation side, you should be because they're reaching out to protect you and to make sure the industry hears your needs and makes this a, a profession that not only will people do, but they'll be proud to do and proud to brag about the fact that they do it. Thanks for being on with us again. This is available to you as well as all the other information that WFCA has been providing at WFCA.org. Have a good rest of the week. God bless. Have a great Labor Day as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.